Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and a very good afternoon. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your kind attention. As we are about to begin, please remain online and please keep your microphone muted. There will be a Q&A session after the lecture. Uh, you may post your questions on the chat box or click the raise hand button to directly ask the, the question to the speaker. Your cooperation is highly appreciated. The lecture is going to start shortly. Thank you. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh and salam sejahtera. Yang berbahagia Board of Directors and Top Management of University Malaya. Yang berusaha Dr. Rohana Jani, Acting Director of the Unku Aziz Center for Development Studies UAC, University Malaya. Yang berbahagia our honorable speaker. Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub, Chairman of the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research MIER. Yang berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Zaiti Aziz, Co-Chair, Board of Governors, Asia School of Business. Yang berusaha our moderator, Associate Professor Dr. Raja Noriza Raja Arifin, Director of the International Institute of Public Policy and Management in Puma, Faculty of Eco Business and Economics, University Malaya. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, Selamat datang, welcome to the Royal Professor of Aziz Public Lecture 2022. Before we begin, let us start our event today with Ummul Kitab Al-Fatiha. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, now I would like to invite Yang Berusaha Dr. Rohana Jani, the Acting Director of the Unku Aziz Center for Development Studies, University Malaya, to deliver her welcoming remarks. Please welcome. Thank you, Mr. Shazril. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh dan salam sejahtera. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, a very warm welcome to Royal Professor Unku Aziz Lecture, public Lecture 2020. On behalf of the Nku Azi Center for Development Studies, University of Malaya, I would like to welcome you to, to today's public lecture entitled Nku Azi's Thoughts and Public Policy by Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbo, the Chairman of Malaysian Institute of Economic Research, MIR. The session will be moderated by Associate Professor Dr. Raja Noriza Raja Arifin, Director of International Institute of Public Policy and Management in Puma. Thank you for accepting our invitation to this event. Thank you. 
The Royal Professor Unku Aziz Lecture Series is one of the core programs of Unku Aziz Center. The main aim is to recognize the contribution of Royal Professor Unku Aziz in the field of poverty development research in Malaysia. This lecture series was initiated in 2014 with the objective of hosting national figures who have tremendous contribution to the nation's development while providing a platform for exchanging ideas, debates, and discourse in the area of poverty and development studies, both locally and internationally. Hence, it is our privilege to have Yang Berbahagia Tan Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub to be the guest speaker for today's public lecture, sharing his, his vast experience as civil servants as well as government administrator. Before we begin, allow me to briefly introduce our moderator for today. Associate Professor Dr. Raja Noriza Raja Arifin is currently the Director of International Institute of Public Policy and Management, in short, IMPUMA. Her areas of expertise include policy analysis, transportation, urban governance, administration, and urban planning. She has published widely in the area of public policy, healthcare, and transportation. Dr. Raja Noriza sits on the editorial board of several journals. Among others, Institution and Economics, International Journal of Chinese Studies, and Journal of Policy and Governments. With that introduction, introduction may I now in, invite Associate Professor Dr. Rajan Oriza to moderate the session. I wish everyone a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Over to you, Dr. Rajan. And Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. All right, uh, I will start with introducing our speaker, our honorable speaker. Uh, Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub is currently the chairman of the Malaysian Institute of Economic Research, or better known as MIER. And he was once a civil servant in the Malaysian government, and his last designation was the director of General Economic Planning Unit, EPU, of the Prime Minister's Department. During his service, he had also served the Ministry of Finance and the Ministry of Domestic Trade and Consumer Affairs. Currently, Tan Sri serves as a member of the Board of Directors, Institute of Strategic and International Studies, sorry, Institute of Strategic um, and International Studies, ISIS, and Perbadanan Tabung Pendidikan Tinggi National, PTPTN. He was also a member of the Competition Appeal Tribunal between 2014 and 2017. Uh, Tan Sri had also been the Chairman of Malaysia Investment Development Authority and was a board member of the Perbadanan Insurance Deposit Malaysia, PIDM and Malaysian Communications and Multimedia Commission, MCMC, for several years. He is also an adjunct professor at the National Institute of Public Policy and Management in Puma and Institute Adun Raza, Uni Raza, where he teaches economics and public policy. Dr. Sulaiman studied economics at University Malaya and then at the University of London and finished his PhD at Maxwell School, Syracuse University, USA. He was the president of Malaysian Economic Association from 2015 to 2018. Uh, he frequently contributes articles on economic policy, public finance and development uh, to the local press, in particular New Straits Times. He has also given lectures abroad on Malaysian economy and public policy in Australia, New Zealand, Japan, South Korea, Pakistan and Sudan, among others. All right, from his impressive CV and background, undoubtedly that he is the rightful person to deliver his talk on Uncle Aziz's thought and public policy. Okay, before we go to Tan Sri, uh, I would like to start with a brief introduction on the content of Tan Sri talk today. Yeah, <clears throat> okay, the Royal Professor Uncle Aziz is the man ahead of his time. Okay? And his contributions is very wide ranging, but his most popular ones are cooperative and Muslim pilgrimage to Mecca. Yeah? And his writings on poverty of basically are uh, referred by officials in the public sector entrusted with developing policy instruments to help improve rural income level. As a result, the concern for productivity and exploitation came out strongly in the formulation of the rural development policy. And his wider concern for addressing inequality to a center stage when the new economic policy was formulated. Roy Professor Nkazis also took the initiative to address skill and manpower needs of the Bumi Putra by setting up the Pusat Sasi as a separate entity in the University of Malaya, preparing the Putra students to the rigorous demands of the faculties of engineering, um, medicine and dentistry, as well as the sciences. 
Mpo Aziz, true to his ideals, promoted the development of cooperatives in the country and even led Angkasa for many years. And now the movement is an institution to be proud of. And one should never forget its contribution, of course, to the Muslim Premier Fund or Tabung Haji, the institution that modernized the administration and management of pilgrims and their savings. So undoubtedly, Professor Mpo Aziz is ahead of his time and a man for all seasons. Okay, I, I don't I don't want to take up the limelight from Tan Sri. All right. Uh, and um, basically what we do here is Tan Sri will give 15 minutes uh, of his presentation, of his thoughts. And then we open the floor for the Q&A session for 20 minutes. And if you have any question throughout the presentation, kindly insert your question in, in the chat box or raise your hand. Okay, Tan Sri, over to you. Thank you. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Salam sejahtera. Um, Dr. Rajan Waiza. My boss at the Inuma. <laughs> Dr. Rohana, I forgot. Uh, director of the uh, Kwasi Center for Development Economics. Um, I saw, I'm told that uh, Tansi Zeti is in attendance. Uh, and also some of the senior staff from the university. Uh, I must thank you for making time to listen to my, 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 my presentation this afternoon. Uh, let me clarify that I'm not, I'm no academician, so you won't see much of the uh, citation uh, and other uh, mathematical formula and that sort of thing. <laughs> um, let me start by say, by making a prayer for, for the Soho Royal Professor Francis. May Allah Almighty shower his infinite blessing and bounties Rahmat on the soul of the Royal Professor and Aziz and his beloved wife, Sharifa Azza, and let him also place their souls among the companies of the Salihin, or the pious ones, and among, also among the Mu'minin, or the believers. Amen. Thank you. Let me thank the director and staffs of the Gwazi Center for Development Studies, particularly Dr. Rahana, for inviting me to make this lecture. I should say it is a big honor to me. I hope I'm able to rise up to the occasion befitting the stature of Royal Professor Prezis, who is a really, really a towering personality in his own way. As you said, um, Doctor, uh, he's a man, um, a man for all season. The name was once given to <laughs> Thomas More. Uh, so um, it's indeed it's an honor for me to speak on him. And to me, he's like a guru, and the guru has a lot of meaning. One who understands what guru has a lot of meaning. Um, I studied in this faculty when he was a lecturer in the dean in the late 60s. So it was sweet memory coming back to the university. Certainly, the University of Malaya, as the Prime Minister of the nation, cannot be detached from the name of President Prabhu Aziz, who has dedicated so much of his attention and time, energy towards the development of the university, especially during the very challenging times uh, in the 70s and 80s. You may know that it is not this university alone that can claim strong association with the late professor. Because several other institutions and movements in the country can also claim equally strong association with uh, the professor. I'm sure this was mentioned by mm. the doctor just now. Um, Tabu Haji or Pilgrim Spanish Fund, the cooperative movement. But you forgot this one movement, very important. They were Bahasa and Pustaka. He was his first director when it was located in Java. So it's also uh, associated with the literary development of the country. Just to share my personal history, just to start or to, to digress a while. When I was in Form 2, 1962, in secondary school uh, in Pontian, a sleepy <coughs> town south of Johor, then someone asked me what would I want to be in the future, Doctor. Mm. I, was, uh, I was a child, and just quick answer was, I want to be an economist like Gwazis. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> 1962. The person asked yeah. me again, what is economics? I said, I don't know, but Gwazis is a Johorian, I want to be like him too. <laughs> I still remember that was bombed too. <laughs> but the nation when attaining independence in 1957, and especially after the emergency ended in 1960, began its initiative to develop the rural areas, which had been hitherto relatively neglected by the colonial power, namely the British. As you know, the rural urban economic disparity was a very significant matter then. And therefore the government began to pursue a policy of rural economic development. Mm -hmm or RED for short, R-E-D, Rural Economic Development. In fact, the book then was also a red book. It's called Red Book. 
It's not Mao Zedong's book, not Mao Zedong's book, <laughs> Red Book. It was our rural economic development. And it was instructed to provide basic infrastructure, such as rural road, school, electricity, portable water, a balai raya, a community hall in the kampung those days, public phone booths, and midwife clinics. In almost all villages, these were provided for. The book Basic Amenities was strengthened again later with, with uh, other initiatives, such as planting of rubber with high yielding clones, and also for a double cropping of uh, paddy among, uh, among the major programs. In this regard, Kwasi said, poverty has three causes, namely low productivity, exploitation, and neglect. I remember this very well. At that time, I don't understand what do you mean by the word neglect? And of course, you know, it means abeyance. You, you don't take care of it. It's very important. This is when Kwasi's idea and concern for poverty became to be very relevant. It's the time when the government granted the low economic development. So that core of concepts, low productivity, exploitation, and neglect became very central the whole concept, the whole idea of move of rural economic development. It's the idea of the cause of poverty, namely low productivity, exploitation, that like, became relevant and guidance perhaps to all officers who were directly involved in the planning implementation of the Red Book <coughs> system. There might be no mention of his name, but it was there, literally. And when I was talking with them, something, you know, during the coffee session, it's always putting quasi's name in it. But unfortunately, uh, uh, the style of the government, they read, they don't mention, they don't quote. You know, that's all. But in the working papers, all those beyond the thing, you've got these names mentioned. Because this one said, the, one, the cause of poverty has been the neglect of these areas in the provision of public facilities, such as education, health, water, supplies, rural roads, etc. Tun Abraza then was the Deputy Prime Minister, was also in charge of rural economic development. Um, he took personal interest in the um, move in the rural economic development, its success, its success and its uh, progress, that sort of thing. Uh, he used to say, I remember you know, uh, sometime when giving a briefing on rural development there in the, we call it operation room in Jalan Matu'on. And Tun Razak said, this room was meant to check where the pulse of development has stopped. I remember, Masitu, you said thing negative. Why is the pulse has stopped? <laughs> yeah, I was a junior officer then. <laughs> the idea of rural development began to emphasize not only development in situ, also establishment of land settlement schemes by Falda and Falkra in order to improve access by the poor to land and high return crops. So in the beginning, it's just in the development in situ, you know, just help them in the, in the village, in the rural areas or something, where they were. But later, it was suggested that they should build, should develop new land. So that land scheme was uh, initiated. And the first one was in the Bilut Valley in Pahang. And then you have Falkra, so for purposes of uh, rehabilitation of lands. You know? And they are given high, uh, about 10 acres per, per settler and with high return crops such as palm oil. Being economists for sure, Kwasias would have been, uh, would have seen the failure of the market to bring about income from the rural Malaya or rural Malaysia then. Equally the concern for market structure that might lead to exploitation. Remember his two concept MM system, monopoly, monopsony, single buyer and single seller came up very strongly. And this led to the establishment of agencies such as uh, Pharma and Bank Britannian, with the purpose of enhancing easy access to rural credit and market, very much echoing the idea of Nkwazis, that the poor is largely exposed to exploitation and equity in the marketplace. Literally, that's, you can see the development. Agencies then, such as Maju Khan and Pharma's Organization Authority, were instituted after that far after Pharma and Bank Britannian. They are aimed to strengthen the farmers and fishermen's stake in emerging economic activities in the rural area. Once economics came up, who is going to benefit from it? So it started, government started farming. No, make sure the interests of the farmers and fishermen were also protected with this pending economy. So he created this Majikan Farmers Organization Authority um, so that uh, not only that they raise, they enjoy the increased production, but whatever processing that took place beyond production, that's, that was the concept then. And um, the Taiwanese model then came in very handy. So several officers were sent to uh, Taiwan to learn agricultural, what they call um, intensive farming. I remember, you know, and mixed farming, test farming was very relevant. So we sent a lot of officials. People like uh, the late Allah Ham Tun Awad Sadi was the, one of the you know, CEO of this uh, farmers organization. So it's given a very important role. And then after that, with the, after 69, 70, uh, we have the new kind of policy that was instituted 
after the fateful May 13th incident of this line. And Aziz's ideas became even more pertinent and significant. As the NEP's first strong strategy was eradication of poverty, irrespective of race. Remember the word irrespective of race. You know, he wants to help everybody in the country to access, irrespective of your Malay, Chinese, Indian. So that, 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 that phrase, eradication of poverty, is very important in respect of race. Mkwazi had studied poverty in rural areas of the country. The poverty study among fishermen was most often cited. I think that's why he got the concept of uh, uh, kemiskinan tak ketara, I remember. In his lectures, kemiskinan tak ketara. The poverty is there, but you don't see it. Tak ketara means not significant, but it is there. It is there, but not there. <laughs> oh, I've not seen that, something like that. Um, he, he defined the poverty after the study in Tengano, he defined poverty as sarong in depth. How many sarongs you have? Uh, Adil Dimalai, Tigalai, sarong, that, that level. So in other words, the, the quality of life must be very, very bad. You are measured by the amount of sarong, some plekat. Can plekat on Jogata. Whether it was indicative of wealth, of ownership, or your, your stature, how many carat sarong plekat, something like that. But then, yeah, so how many sarong person had them? I remember when I was a student, uh, some of us, some, some that just chuckled. Yeah? Yeah. But I remember it was uh, something real on the ground. Because I remember in my kampung, whenever people just married, they visit all, uh, some hitmen. My uncle's go to kampung. Whenever a couple came visit him, uh, you know, after marriage, he always give satu, the bridegroom a sarong. So it means something in the rural. We, we don't know. That's why I think Kohaz is very perceptive. He saw this. Eh? The income level has been so low that number of sarongs was an indicator of one's own status in the world. And giving a sarong as a gift to bedroom, as a gesture, was a subject, subject norm. And when I was in APU, I personally remembered a meeting that I chaired of the development of socioeconomic indicators to measure the success of development efforts or lack of it as part of understanding on the issues of poverty and quality. So I opened the discussion uh, in EPU, but it so happened I was the one from EPU then, I was picked by all those who attended to chair the meeting. So I have gotten quasis then. Uh, by the time he was, he was the vice chancellor. So given the floor, so many secretary generals and directors came and listened. Discussion, I was taking notes as well as chairing the session. And of course, when quasis had the floor, he, he was very, very, you know, uh, it was very uh, forthcoming in trying to elaborate poverty so that you people in PU must know, don't just be top, you know, there's some measurements here and there. The whole concept of poverty, the depth of it, to fathom the depth of poverty, so it was there. So I, it's another lesson in tuition for me after graduation in 1971. As, as always the case, because it's not, not only concerned with income and productivity, to also examine the implications of poor nutrition and put and take upon the productivity of rural families. There is an article about nutrition. That's very good. Uh, I have I've got to mention this because it's the bearing what I'm going to say uh, several minutes down the road. A graduate in 1971 June and mid 1972 was placed in the APU, an agency that was known for its role in economic development planning. I heard about APU in the class of rural development by Sivaratnam here in, in this faculty. No APU was mentioned, and I, I, was, I majored in applied economics then. I really wanted to work in APU and I got it, thank God. Guess what? In Kwasi's ideas of poverty became more relevant to me. In late 1972, I was picked up by the former Director General C.L. Robles and said, Suleiman, I want to hit this new, to, to be the leader of this set group, uh, a new section called Poverty Analysis, and I want you to be in charge of it. So it was one man show then, starting with. So what to do? He gave me two things. He said, first, you define the poverty line income, work on it, I don't care how you do it. You do it. Number two, build up the public profile who they are. I want to know. Because we have big tasks in eradicating poverty. How do you eradicate poverty? It's not the word just reduce poverty, eradicate poverty. So it's given that task, it's a very challenging one. And um, what to do? I was asked to, uh, and, and this is a tall order for me, as I was then a very junior officer. It's just about 30 years of service. What you do is go to the library, and, and I know that in course, has done a lot of studies. So pick up all those all articles in the Kajian Economy Malaysia and Sarah of the Mission Economic Journal that, where he has written uh, on the subject. So begin to read. Is it about four or five articles about what does it mean? The poverty and poverty, that's what does it mean? Uh, because you read the American text, uh, textbook will be different. American talking about maybe the psychology of poverty. 
the feeling of hopelessness, feeling of despair, you know, that sort of thing. Uh, disenfranchisement, that sort of thing. Because whereas here, it's different. You're talking about a very structural side, your income, your nutrition, your, your education, sort of things. So I got to build this profile. So I began to browse the library in APU and read more on poverty related studies, especially the articles written up by, by Nkwazi. So the poverty line income that was construct, constructed then, I established a, a team with uh, Tansi Asha Ayo and several, then who was judged to Asha Ayo. We developed this thing and began to define, to look at the elements that make up a poverty line income. And the first thing that came to mind was nutrition. I remember Uncle Aziz uh, write up this, nutrition and vitamin, that's what we important. Yeah. So I said, I must, have the, I must have the nutritional component of it. That's one. Number two, Uncle Aziz said, there are also other elements of, that you must address, water, electricity. So the other essential requirements of life, of livelihood. So water, electricity, that sort of thing, housing. And so that came in picture. Then finally, I, I brought in also people from the IMA, Institute of Medical Research, from Sir T, Dr. T. Isyong, nutrition specialist, to define me what is the requirement, standard of five members of five, uh, uh, five family, five plus three, something, you know, two plus three, so five. So what are the, the, parent, the parents' the consumption requirement, the children's parents, you know, the average family defined. So got that. And then I called the Department of Statistics with me, uh, working the team. You get the average consumption. What is the average pattern of consumption uh, of these people, especially low income people? And then define bayam ke kacang, kangko, and so on. And then I asked the, uh, Dr. T, so you define the calorific requirement, uh, uh, what you call uh, total of this to get what you want. So you define it. I think you got so I am over there, Dr. T is there, and you found social welfare defining uh, the clothing and wear. And the girl, the boys, the boys. And that sort of thing. So we define and get the point. So you, you check, you check. And then we calculated, we come to a figure of 180 ringgit per month. And on the on the uh, on the on the basis of 5.3, you get something like exactly 30 ringgit per capita. And it divided by 5.3, you still get 30 ringgit per capita. So you define that. Having defined that, so what I did was um, I asked the um, department of statistics. When is the latest income data you have? So he said that the post generation survey for 1971 covering about 25,000 families and they have complete income, both uh, kind and non kind. He said, now you run, how much is the percentage below having income below 180 And they got exactly 49.3% of the population. So I got that. I said, now you run the profile Malay, Chinese, Indian, others, rural, urban, state, Johor, Kedah, Kelantan, and then Masuk. I want to see. And then occupation, farmers, screening, and educational. I got the complete thing. I went back to Tansi Ashad by then, but became deputy general. He discussed him sekali. He started questioning, beginning very, very detail. Then, having done that, I got to present it to the highest level of government. You got to set it as a matter of policy. So you see how Nkwazi thought they get translated. Slowly, slowly, slowly get translated. This is very significant. Uh, contribution to uh, public policy, people don't realize it. It is there through students. Uh, the through students. So I presented the EPO, all the head department. Nobody agreed with me. They said it's too high. So, but uh, all right, I said, I've done this. This is the basis. Let me up what you want to question. You got to accept it. All right, they, they don't want to make decision yes or no. We presented the National Development Planning Committee, which is a committee of official of the highest level, only Secretary General Dr. Yanukan. I was very junior officer, just about fourth year service, <laughs> something like that. And uh, presented in the PC, all disagree, except one man. Except one man. Uh, he, he was the former governor of Bank Negara, Tun Ismail Ali. He, 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 he didn't open much time, he listened to the discussion. He didn't talk much. But then he said, he said the, the, the methodology seems scientific and objective. Don't discuss the amount. Though. If you agree to the, the methodology, you accept it, you define it, then, then whatever the pertinent is consequent. I remember that. So he said the, the methodology seems to be acceptable, scientific. Then he asked, Do you have better methodology? Nobody said anything. Then he said, If that is so, we accept it. And then uh, uh, um, we use that as the basis for planning. So it was accepted, and um, that began a lot of analysis of that. So that profile presented the to the cabinet again. I was a junior officer. I got to present to the cabinet. I know it was it was it's, it's not very frightening experience. 
your junior officer got to de uh, deal with the cabinet representative. The senior one don't want to go. So I accepted all the blow. <laughs> Doesn't matter. But I remember, uh, I remember Tansi, uh, 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 Zali Hamza, thank you Zali Hamza, questioning me. It's very high, very high. Anyway, finally, we got to accept it. Uh, now you got to brief the parliament. <laughs> so I got to brief all the uh, back, back, back benches of the uh, Barisan then. Because they got to defend it on, my, on our behalf. They are going to argue with the opposition. So I got to defend them. They, uh, I, I went uh, before them. It's been, so they got to defend in the debate parliament. And after that, having got the board, board profile, uh, if you call for a World Bank mission uh, on rural poverty and FAO, and I was attached as a counterpart economist between them. And uh, it was led by somebody by the name of uh, John DeWilder. The first thing I did was, after having this cabinet, I said, John, and John, I said, I got to arrange you to meet in Kwasis. So I presented him. Then when you go, I didn't follow, but he went to see John DeWilder. And now DeWilder said, he, he, you know, this man knows so much of the issue then. He was so given a big, a big understanding of the depth of the problem. So John DeWilder uh, met her back when uh, uh, was the, the vice chancellor. Then, as you may know, as you may know, the third major plan then, 1970-1980, had a very large allocation to help the poor. So, if you look at third major plan, and the chapter on poverty was I was done. I was involved personally writing and drafting. Actually. Of course, edited as you go along. Detailed profile, who they are, Mustali, and that marked the decision to allocate a lot of allocation for poverty allocation. I remember some 37% total development budget for that plan was just to bring uh, to eradicate poverty. Uh, covering massive regional land development programs, double cropping paddy, replanting of rubber and coconut, drainage irrigation, low cost housing, applied nutrition project, and rural school, and many, many more. And that's what we should come to 7%. So that was when it was allocated and, uh, you know, and um, analyzed. They all meant to address not only low income, but the quality of life of the poor. So remember, the applied nutrition project was there. I remember, right? we, we, then this education ministry was asked to define. Don't forget, this project benefited all. Don't forget, because it involved a lot of contract work, business work. So many people involved in business got, got advantage too by, by you know, undertaking those projects. So it benefited all. So people will say that NEP did not help them much, not right. The second concern of Kwasi is, is that uh, uh, was inequality. And of course, poverty can be a big, um, uh, uh, can be a, a big cause of uh, central cause of inequality. So that can can see, you know, uh, in the market structure, that sort of thing. Uh, and the second part of the was identification of race is to restructure society so that the identification of race is no more along economic function. Uh, that's uh, the, the second prong of the new type policy. And before before that, I remember Quasi's. Um, uh, supervise a master's thesis in income decision by Lin Lin Yen. So it was presented uh, here in faculty. I listened to it presented by Lin Yen. Professor Lin, I don't know why you see Lin Yen, you know. It was the first study done. Uh, it was a uh, supervisor of course himself. And that began the importance of understanding income distribution. So the data from the, the post innovation survey, 25,000 families, household income was analyzed in greater depth in terms of inequality, not just basic uh, poverty, but inequality across the board. Inequality across region, inequality between races, inequality between education was literally a big surgery was done to the data. Big analysis was done to the data really, to, to, to analyze the extent of inequality. Yeah. So I was involved in this. It is still in my division where I work. we call it poverty analysis and income distribution. So we're working together on this, and that led to the importance of income stream study in Asia. And later, uh, you have studies by, uh, I remember, Snodgrass and Sudir Anand and the World Bank. Then, in fact, the World Bank book in 1974 called Growth the Essence of the New Net Policy. Remember, we call it, mostly they call it Growth the Essence. So this thing became really important, honey, and all this thing behind it is in quasi stock. So it's very, very deep in the policy making processes. In the nexus of policy making, honey, she's views are there. And because of the importance of income and inequality, then I think the group of economists uh, from UKM then. Uh, uh, took the subject uh, as an area of concern, very uh, important area of further research and study. So people like uh, the late uh, Professor Smas uh, the late Dr. Satchari, uh, the names these are behind the examination after Lin Lin study, 
uh, so that we can impact this for further research on, on, that, uh, on, on income distribution. Okay? And, then, and then after that, there are many, many more. So poverty and inequality are related issues. They cannot be decoupled mm -hmm. because poverty is the essence, it is the core of inequality. Yeah? That's all. So it became, they are interrelated. So we tend to look at it from that complete comprehensive perspective. Yeah? All right. Um, let me just move in terms of time and then just move a bit faster. Um, so, and cause this um, uh, concern of low productivity and exploitation and neglect must be examined then, and the public policy should undertake development programs covering not only yield enhancement, but also marketing, education, housing, and food intake. So that is part how he was, his views are very strong in the area of uh, uh, poverty and income distribution. Because next one, I think is, is concerned is cooperative development, which you have mentioned. It's a very important instrument as part of poverty education is to make sure that as an institution, uh, the farmers have a greater say of the uh, economic pie that, that grew after increasing production. That's where the co-op is supposed to come in. Yeah? Uh, so that they get, they collectively, they can have a bigger stake in undertaking uh, new economic practices that emerge after enhancement of production at the farm level. And so that's so that, that very important cooperative development. And he put a big concern in it. And of course, um, uh, he was, as you said, just now, uh, Chair, uh, he was heading Ancasa for many, many years, uh, you know. And, uh, but our Kuti movement is not as yet strong as the one, for example, in Scandinavian countries, I see, uh, in Europe. They are much, much stronger in terms of their uh, control in the market, distribution, and uh, that sort of thing. We are not. I think here, um, this is an area where I think the government has not, not uh, uh, given much attention. The, the government does help, more, but uh, not on a very sustained basis, on a cooperative basis, uh, on, on a cooperative development country. But I think that's something that um, the government has got to pick up uh, on. And let me not talk more on cooperative development. My main concern is Abun uh, main concern is again on education. Being an educationist himself, uh, university is concerned education comes on almost naturally. Um, I, think, um, uh, I think one main area that I wanted to mention here, I think you all know, um, other than you know, improving the university, uh, strengthening many new courses. But he was the one who first set up Pusat Sasi, or Center for Education for Center for Foundation Study. Before other universities have that upper foundation program, yeah? that's an, uh, Pusat Sasi. And this gave a chance to Malay students who were not able to perform well, or uh, not expected to do well than the HSC, STPM, or STPM those days. Because HSC is quite, demands a lot of a uh, command of good like English. Mm -hmm. one, I know. Malay people, Malay boys and girls in Kampung may not be strong in this at that point time. And also demands a lot of maturity, good command of uh, in terms of to express your, your thoughts or something. So he created the created the uh, Pusat Sasi. Um, and let me quote what he said here. Is to create a regular supply of well-prepared students for such faculties as medicine, dentistry, engineering, and science. You see, I'm going to set up a center for education, center for foundation studies in science. We have, deliberately, I like say, we have deliberately set out to collect boys and girls from neglected school in the rural areas on a strict quota basis yeah, for the whole country. We prefer the best students from the worst schools rather than the worst students from the best schools. That is thought about his, there must be something in that. I want, I want the best students from the worst school rather than the, the worst students among the best schools. The worst students in the best school must be good. Why <laughs> The worst students, for example, BI, maybe be, is far ahead of the best students in, in my, my kampong, for example, or in Pontian, where I came from, that sort of thing. Yeah? So there must be something that, in other words, he wants to give second chances yeah? and give them wherever there's some structural causes that make them don't perform well, that must be addressed. In, incidentally, that was the very, very thing that Ashar Ayub thought. Give the Malay, the Malay boy a second chance because they were handicapped along. And these views are held when the director general appeal. Uh, when I look at allocation Sabah and Sarawak, I look at the schools there. Some schools in Sabah and Sarawak, as late as the 09, has only one hour of electricity or two hours of electricity. And the nearest, the nearest, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the nearest clinic in the event that the uh, children fell sick, maybe three or four hours by boat, or four hours by boat. So is that amount of uh, uh, differential, economic differential still exists as late as 2009 was the uh, So there are a lot of things I did 
to help the Sabah Sarawak people, for example, uh, in terms of uh, uh, facilities and amenities, uh, that, that sort of thing. Um, so when I was the chairman of uh, TM, I understand that concept of relativity. TM gave a scholarship to, to students after I was chairman then. You must get four distinctions to get TM scholarship. And when I saw the let me see the list, he said, not even one from Sabah and Sarawak. I said, you don't understand how difficult they are to get even one distinction. They got to work for several hours. Let's see just what's wrong. So I said, you reduce it to two, two distinctions. The moment they reduce, we get about five or six to Sabah and something like that, at least something. So the, the people didn't appreciate this relative kind of a poverty, <laughs> how do you call it, which uh, is very important differential sort of thing. So, uh, Nkwazi, what Nkwazi did, he brought 250 students every year, carefully selected, and was uh, given two year pre university courses. And, you know, is picked up from all states on a prorata basis. Pro, uh, pro, pro basis. Okay, from then on, you see the combination of student intake in all the engineering departments were quite fair. You know, quite fair, quite good, and there's some semblance of population structure of the country. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, you have a non list there and then list congregating around arts and economics, that kind of thing, social sciences. Yeah? There's something different. Okay, um, that's I thought it good, uh, successful. It proves the fact that, you know, the Malays were not really stupid in mathematics and sciences, which many of us thought. They could do it given a chance. So it's proven by Asha Ayob and later it's proven by Inquazis. That's, that's something that I think contributed a lot to eradication of economic differential, social differential between rural urban and between ethnic groups. Right? The very fundamental basis of national unity. Okay? So, mm -hmm. Now, the third part, I think, which I think Kuazis has been very, very active, is Tabung Haji. I don't want to mention Mak Tabung Haji, um, but what's important here is that it's an institution that mobilized Malay Muslim saving long before PNB. <laughs> you know, when he was asked that paper recommended this institution, where the savings for the people wanted to go to Hajj, on Islamic basis, invested in Islamic basis, and then modernize the institutions of saving. Otherwise, the Malays then would save in the form of livestock. You keep the cows and uh, you keep that land, sell them when you go to Hajj, and then finally you come back, you don't have land. You start borrowing again. So being a Muslim, he, he, he uh, Kwasis definitely was concerned with this, and he recommended this uh, 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 Haji, and it was run on a very more, uh, modern uh, basis of uh, role of uh, mobilizing saving investing into very productive places uh, in, 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 uh, in plantations and certain properties and that sort of thing. Look at what happened now, Tabu Haji, nothing to do <laughs> with the project. But the fact of the matter is, that was the first institution to mobilize saving and invested on uh, uh, the Islamic basis, yeah? which, is, which is, you can call it Sharia compliant. <laughs> so um, uh, I mentioned that uh, before that, um, the rural areas were not, and the savings very much in the form of just livestock or lands, you know, and, and then they sold it, and they come back, some of them be deprived income. And you know, livestock, after you reach um, the maximum weight of that, the marginal revenue is not the marginal return anymore. Mm -hmm. You keep on feeding the cow, the cow won't get any more flesh. You reach the maximum height. So must dispose. When you reach the maximum height, it's marginal revenue, you feel marginal land. Of course, you must dispose. Uh, otherwise, you're feeding, the cows don't accumulate wealth anymore. So these people you don't understand, but these are the things was this uh, introduced. And collectively, the savings are very large and powerful source of fund to the community. And we kind of, you know, um, and it's attributed to, to Kwasi's much, much before Tabura National Brahat was in the, in the uh, early 80s. Eh? Lastly, in my presentation is that uh, I like history, although I'm not a historian, but I read this book by Footprint Sense of Time by Kwasi again. Uh, you know, very interesting, always trying to compare himself and Zaba. Uh, Zaba was in the 40s. Zaba was a literary person, uh, well known uh, for trying to put modern uh, Malay, Malay language. Uh, so, I, when Zaba was writing about Malay poverty, about education, that sort of thing, just like Aziz did later, he revisited it very concerned. So, there's some similarity between the two. When Zaba did that, there was one, 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 uh, one very, maybe, you know, I don't know whether he's English or Malaysian, Malay, I don't know, but he wrote a parody, uh, 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 quoted in Kohazi's book. Tell me not in mournful numbers that the Malays is dying race, for their soul isn't dead with slumbers, 
even in the old miserable days. So even you, you, you are you're slumbering, you are still not, you're not miserable. Be, continue to be lazy, so to speak. You take, take your time. And then the same person, tell me not in most numbers the way to improve the Malays, for surely every Malay remembers, be contented and be modest always. So in other words, trying to maintain the culture always, <laughs> uh, trying to be very contented, don't work hard, take your uh, nap and that sort of thing. So, yeah. But I, I, example came out, I think interesting uh, reply to the same party. And, uh, and this was in 19, uh, you know, uh, early for, uh, in 1900s. I tell you not in mournful numbers, says Zaba, that the Malays are dying graves. I only want the soul that slumbers to wake and work in these bright days. Beautiful answer. Zaba say, I tell you not in mournful numbers the way in which to improve the Malays. I want that each Malay remembers more discontented shouldn't be always. If you want to know about this, read the article by Nkwazi's uh, Footprints in the Sense of Time. It's very well written. Very well written, very well articulated about the concern of education. I know, at that point, people are very fatalistic. You feel like, what is it? If you don't have a lot of money, you don't have a lot of you never become a paddy. You don't have a lot of money, you don't have But if you plant them as your seed, hundreds of tons of paddy. So these are the things. So in conclusion, I've taken much of the time. I was given in 20 minutes by the chairman, the chairperson. Nursing causes was very, was very concerned with poverty and quality and the need to have public policies to address the causes of poverty, which you mentioned. The many programs I'm taken to, uh, to share with you, many programs I'm taken to address poverty you know, reflect a lot, a lot of his thoughts, reflect in programs I mentioned just now, the access to land, uh, improving yields in situ, importantly, improving skills and education attainment by the Malays. So literally, what it says, it's literally a very comprehensive way of looking at poverty. And indeed, indeed, the statistics on AP do indicate that absolute poverty did decline during the 1997 period. While percentages of Malays in modern education, such as doctors and lawyers, are now much more higher than, uh, are now about, now is about, about 50 to 60 percent. But in the 70, when I measure, we measure it, it's just about 5 to 7 percent level. That's what I'm saying. So all this is a result of education. In terms of quality, as also measured by Gini coefficient ratio, and the mean income ratios do indicate that this, this, uh, they have tended towards uh, uh, the decline in the quality. In conclusion, but, uh, doctor, I think that um, I must say something. Uh, um, it is this recognition of significant contribution to the attainment of many public policy concerns that the Malaysian Economic Association, when I happened to be chair, and of course, the decision of the committee, decided to reprint his works in 2017 on the occasion of his 95th birthday on 28th January, which is tomorrow. So I must congratulate that you pick up this day today, the day before that. Tomorrow is a memorial day uh, for his family, it was 28th January. Then Madam Suman, uh, I forgot to name Suman Renier, close friend Pak was very instrumental in organizing these reprints and hundreds of hours of editing and proofreading to make them one solid book. We have now five volumes. And we, I had the honor to give it to Nkwazi personally, who was seated on the wheelchair. But I can see his eye, he was very happy. You know? In this regard, I do hope that there should be greater recognition of Professor uh, Nkwazi. Uh, and I hope more discourses be undertaken by the center or the university uh, to, you know, to, to debate or to discuss a bit on these thoughts in so many areas, you know, economics, development, uh, education, of course. And also from the government side, after there may be some uh, better recognition, maybe giving some good decorations or what. Then, and definitely a person who qualify for a title, Tunship, you can be given on a post famous basis. Hmm? Uh, I said this is a short lecture, don't take more of your time. I, it's an honor to me, and um, I thank you again. Uh, thank you again, uh, Dr. Rohana, for giving the opportunity. I thank the center for organizing this function, and thank you all for listening to me. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, um, Tanshree, for mm -hmm. the very insightful talk yeah, on Royal Professor Nko Aziz. Okay, now, I'll thank you for now, but we have a sure. correct Q&A uh, sure. question a session after this. All right. Um, okay, let's see. Um, and uh, if you have any question, kindly ins either insert your question in the chat box or raise your hand. Let me see. 
uh, questions? Any question? I don't see any question right now. Yes, as a student. Yeah. <laughs> My former student at the one. Oh, yeah, privileged to have been a post grad student of Tansri <laughs> at FEA in 2001. Always an inspirer. That's, uh, one. So That's I... not a question. Yeah. Uh, thank That's you. Shafina Rahim, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah. So, do you have any more questions from? I see. I see Tansri then, eh? Tansi Zati. <laughs> Good to see you, Tansi. Oh, Tansi Zati is Tansi here. Zeti. All right. Say something, please. Tansi Zati is here. Okay. You I'll can like cross to... examine now, Tansi Zati. Yeah. <laughs> maybe, Tansi Zeti. maybe I have, I have not done much justice, your father. You may want to add some more. <laughs> yeah. Tansi Zati is here. Do you like to say something, Tansi? Yeah, he was, yeah, thanks. Yeah. Huh? Can, can hear you, Tansi uh, Zeti. Can how to unmute? Huh? Unmute. Uh, please unmute, Tansi Zeti. Unmute. Huh? Oh. All right. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you for very much for being here. Tansri. She's saying something. She's saying something. Because Zeti is saying something. She's saying something. Saying something. She's saying something. Huh? Oh. Yeah. Uh, Tansri. Yeah. Can you hear Tansri? Uh, yeah. Uh, Tansri right. Zeti. Are you able to hear oh. me? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Please, Tansri Zeti. Yes. yes. Well, first of all, uh, thank you very much to the Gwazi uh, Center for Development Studies. Uh, it's, uh, um, we are very grateful that uh, my father's legacy, uh, we are very grateful for, for my father's legacy to be continued, uh, uh, especially by the um, uh, the University of Malaya. Actually, tomorrow, the Faculty of Dentistry, which he established the dentistry, they are also having an event uh, of 50th anniversary of their uh, uh, establishment, uh, which I'm actually going to in person. <laughs> um, so uh, the university has very much um, uh, recognized, given recognition to his uh, contributions uh, and uh, his legacy uh, lives on. So we're very uh, grateful for that. Uh, a lot of people, of course, know the, uh, uh, about his contribution in establishing Tabu Haji, as was mentioned, and then Ankasa and the cooperative. But actually, uh, probably his main contribution is what, what has been discussed today by Tansri uh, Sulaiman Mahmoud is uh, on poverty and poverty eradication. When he was a very young man, and I remember, and I even met uh, Guna Merdal, who wrote the Asian drama uh, mm -hmm. and got the Nobel Prize uh, for it, uh, came to Singapore and he interviewed my father and uh, wanted my father to go back with him to Stockholm and uh, to work with him. And my father told Guna Merdal that uh, he was a nationalist and he wanted to serve his own country. And Guna Merdal was shocked because he thought that my father was uh, uh, giving up a great opportunity uh, to work uh, with him uh, and uh, told my father that he would really regret this decision that, you know, uh, to stay back in, in, at that time at the University of Land, Singapore. But of course, my father never did. And in terms of uh, his greatest contribution, it would be uh, in uh, poverty, rural development. And related to that, of course, is education. Uh, he believed that education opened the doors and uh, addressed the issue of uh, 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 Poverty in, uh, um, and of course, what uh, 
Sri Sulaiman mentioned, of course, was that uh, uh, the Sarong Index. When I mentioned it to uh, the, the famous professor in, um, in New York, uh, um, the, the, no, not Stieglitz, it's the, uh, the other one uh, who works in the uh, Millennium Goals and so on. Uh, who was the, the first professor in was it Jeffrey Sachs? Uh, was it Jeffrey Sachs? Yes, yeah. who wrote a very nice letter actually of condolence uh, to me uh, because, and I asked him, I said, uh, what do you think of the, the Sarong Index? Because a lot of people chuckled over it. And he said, that is an index of measuring deprivation. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's a deprivation index. And, and it's true. And um, I would like to also mention that there are about 10 Malay sayings, and I only learned about this when I have been involved this 2021 uh, 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 in finalizing the translation of my mother's book, one of the chapters uh, into English, uh, because I felt that the international community should know about this Malay heritage of textiles and costumes. And the chapter on sarongs actually discussed these 10 sayings that talks about how the Malays have uh, uh, all these sayings to measure poverty, to measure poverty that, uh, uh, that you don't even have a sarong to the, uh, uh, that you wear it on your body uh, wet and dry because that was the only thing that you had. And so it measures these extreme poverties in these 10 sayings. So it's culturally amongst the Malay to really talk about the sarong. And so people who don't know about this cultural aspect don't appreciate that it is a measure of deprivation, exactly what Jeffrey Sachs had said. And um, so, but in any case, uh, I, I just also do want to mention that I'm going through is uh, quite sad and at the same time uh, uh, brings back many memories because I'm going through my father's things now and found many things. And in fact, uh, um, uh, amongst the things was the original paper that he wrote on disguised starvation and he talks about it. And people talk about the vicious circle of poverty, but he, mm -hmm. he talked it in a, a three-dimensional, that it is a vicious spiral because you're poor and you become poorer and poorer. And it's not just a circular uh, two-dimensional spiral, but it is a, a two-dimensional circle, but it's a spiral, a three-dimensional, all the forces that make you, when you're poor, you become poorer and poorer. Uh, so uh, a vicious spiral. Uh, and then, of course, what uh, you have mentioned in your uh, speech today, in your talk today uh, about uh, nutrition, he discussed in very detail uh, that uh, he called it disguised starvation because you may be eating the, the, uh, uh, a certain amount of food, but it's all the wrong kind of food without the nutritious elements and it doesn't develop your brain, your cognitive development and your physical development and then giving you any health resilience as well. So it's all discussed and this paper, which is so relevant on disguised starvation and poverty was written in the 1950s. So I felt that, um, you know, he, he, he foresaw so many things that uh, are continue to be discussed by the World Bank now and, and other international organizations that uh, have not been addressed. And it become worse now because of the COVID uh, pandemic lasting not just for our country, but the whole world, that the, the inequality is rising. People are getting poorer because of the circumstances of, of uh, what this pandemic has affected the functioning of economies. Uh, uh, is one of the outcomes of it. And so, uh, and then we used to talk about the digital divide 
will the digital divide become worse because people who don't have access to this digitalization that has been accelerated because of the COVID and the lockdowns and you know uh, a way that we have to function because this pandemic is around not just for Malaysia but the whole world um, is uh, um, causing uh, these problems uh, to to continue. So it's very important that there's recognition of it. And while attention has to be paid to uh, providing relief to people who are affected uh, by the COVID, by the floods, it's very important to provide relief to them. But at the same time, simultaneously, there has to be um, attention given to all these structural types of policies to deal with uh, the poverty that you mentioned throughout your talk. Uh, requires uh, structural changes to education, to all the systems that you said throughout your career that you were actually assigned to, to work on. Uh, it's become, uh, I'm not sure anyone who has carried forward uh, the work, uh, continued the work that you were doing when you were a young man uh, uh, in the EU and, and in other parts of government. Yes. So once again, uh, thank you very much to the University of Blair and to Tan Sri Sulaiman uh, for uh, giving this talk. Uh, uh, our family is always very touched at uh, all this uh, 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 recognition and uh, uh, discussion of these works and that it still continues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Tan Sri. Thank you, Tan Sri. Thank you so much, Tan Sri, yeah, for the insightful. All right, uh, we have this week from Shopina Rahim a request this week saying that uh, for Tansu Zetri to share the latest book scholarly treasure for publication, such valuable thoughts shouldn't go unknown. But uh, this is my answer, I, I will answer this. The collection of Umka Aziz can be found at the Aziz Resource Center. Under UAC or at Zabbas Memorial Library, Simlaya, you can find the treasure there, basically, the, the writings on Umkrazis. Yeah. All right. Um, we have another question uh, Suraya. from Suraya. Suraya from UPNM. Income in inequality in Malaysia widened even, even while median household income rose to 5,873 in 2019, according to uh, latest statistics. So what is our position in achieving Malaysia great as one of Malaysia economic agenda? Yeah, please, Tan Sri. Um, yeah, I think she, she's correct. Mm -hmm. um, while the uh, median income has risen, mm -hmm. but the inequality could have been getting out of, con mm -hmm. out of control, so to speak. Yeah? So after 19, policy of the 1970 policy, there was not much very conscious effort to address uh, inequality again. Yeah. So you can see even, you know, uh, some, some inequality numbers getting a bit, uh, a bit higher, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it's, it's quite true. Uh, what is important, I think, is to, to, to push the economy with, the, with uh, high productivity mm -hmm. uh, projects and go for the high income um, policies so that you can cross them. Um, um, what call the middle income trap in that sort of thing. And um, don't go for these labor intensive industries which are creating small value addition to the economy. Uh, and this among the, and also in terms of wages. Our wages is about 31% of GDP or GNP, whereas in Singapore about 45%, Korea South Korea about 45%. Uh, and uh, and the, um, uh, Europe something like about 55%. So the share of wages, the total economy pie, is uh, just about not even a, not, not even a third. Mm -hmm. So I think we should be talking about high high wage policy, high income policy, that sort of thing, so that uh, and go for high productivity uh, uh, production, of the industry, so that people share the benefit, mm -hmm. you know, can everybody can benefit from it. My quick response, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Suraya. Yeah. All right, thank you, Tan Sri. Um, okay, do we have any other question? 
No question? We don't have any question, yeah? Okay. Um, all right, from Azman, yeah? And it, Assalamualaikum. It was estimated that about one to two million more Malaysian could fall into poverty. What is the best way to help the poor in Malaysia cope with the challenges posed by the pandemic? I think this point was uh, acknowledged by Tasi Zeti just now. The pandemic could have made people mm, worse. Yeah. You know, people lost their jobs, lost their income, lost their means of income, you know, that sort of thing. So this is something that uh, the government has got to address this very, very seriously. It has got a lot bearing on in terms of mental health of the people. Mm, yeah. you know? And then by Gaia. Uh, of course, but at the same time, the government is having fiscal problem. It's revenue um, compared to expenditure. The expenditure is very high, you know, compared to revenue. So, uh, so the government is constrained. Uh, I think we got to uh, look into um, how to promote new economic activities that you know, high value crops, high value production is something that will help the people. There are a lot even uh, even agriculture we are importing now. A lot of products we are importing. How can we put um, put this crop being being you know being produced locally? You know, um, so rather than money just flow out you know, from the economy, at least the people, local people, can benefit from the production. You know, that, that, that sort of thing. I guess government has got to re examine the whole kind of structure now post pandemic. We have not come out of the uh, of the of the, uh, the uh, what called the, the problem yet. You know, uh, we have not fully recovered. That's all. At least up to 2019 numbers, we have not. But a lot of things got to be done now. A lot of planning must be done now. Okay, thank you, Tansi. Do you have any more questions? Okay, if you don't have any questions, I have one question. Yeah. <laughs> Basically on, yeah, because you talk about high value crop, yeah? Mm -hmm. And we import a lot, a lot of our food. We were talking about food security now. 50 uh, and billion. Yeah, we, 50 billion. 50 billion. Oh, yeah. Wow. And uh, the problem is when we have like this pandemic, it's yeah. difficult, but uh, we have like um, it's a uh, stop. Yes, things stop from coming in, especially food. Mm -hmm. So um, and people are talking about we are basically focusing on commodity um, compared to the European, for example. They yeah. are focusing on and in Japan, yeah. they are focusing on food production instead yeah. of commodity. Yeah. So what should we do about this? Actually. Uh. Yeah, we have been, we are trying to promote manufacturing, mm -hmm. but there are low value added manufacturing. Mm -hmm. If you combine export and imports manufacturing, it's easily about 150% of GDP. Mm -hmm. But exports and manufacturing minus imports manufacturing, hardly 7% of GDP. So, so the value addition is small, hardly 15%, mm -hmm. you know, of the industrial sector. So there's something we've got to address. And in terms of the food, you look at Singapore is doing it. Singapore is really planting on tops of flats and top of condos now. So, you know, uh, they use technology. I'm sure with highly educated population now, we have all graduates from 30 over you know, universities or much more there. And so I'm sure they can be, they have skills and technology that can be tapped for high productive farming, high, high value crops. Hmm. And that's all. We, we can. We can do it. Uh, we got to change a lot of uh, the way of doing things. The Ministry of Culture may have got to address this concern. Yeah. yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you, Tansi. Um, okay. I, I would like to wrap up the, the what has been discussed by Tansi here. Yeah. Basically, uh, Panku is a man of many hats. Yes. Yeah. And basically, if you look at what he has been doing, he is basically a linguist, a social a sociologist, yeah. economist, of course, from his background, yeah. and psychologist, and a poet as well. Poet. Yeah. yeah. So you can see very multi multidisciplinary man. I think because of that, he has because of his um, thinking is very much influenced by the West and the Islamic scholars as well. Yes. So so you you are presented with a man of any head. Mm -hmm. Yeah. With a man, it's not a man beyond his time, but a timeless man. <laughs> yeah. So man for all season. Yeah, man for all season. Thank you for that. Yeah, with that, um, I would like to um, pass this. Thank you so much, Tansri. Thank, Thank you. you so much, Tansri Zeti as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I would like to 
pass this to Shadrin. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, yang berbahagia Tan Sri Datuk Sri Dr. Sulaiman Mahbub, yang berusaha Sosik Profesor Dr. Raja Noriza Raja Arifin as well as Tan Sri Dr. Zeti Aziz for the very insightful and interesting session. Distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, we have come to an end of the event. On behalf of the Unku Aziz Center for Development Studies, University Malaya, I would like to express our gratitude for your participation and time to be with us today. Before we leave, please stay for a minute for a group photo session. Please switch uh, on. Please switch on your video uh, for the photography session. Thank you. Okay, one, two, three, smile. Okay, another one. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, okay, one more. One, two, three. So today we have more than 100 participants join for this session. Thank you very much. Okay, uh, now let us end our event today by reciting Tasbih Kafarah and Suratul Auf. Subhanakallah. Thank you and have a pleasant day ahead. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you.